All right. Um, welcome to our panel discussion on solving the talent dilemma, uh, how to navigate recruitment in today's market. My name is Joe Cologne, and I'm the head of Global Teams. Um, I've been working at Employment Hero for about a year now, and uh, with Global Teams, we look at how we can help businesses like yourselves to recruit talent worldwide. Um, just a little bit about myself. I've lived and worked in five countries throughout the world um, and have mostly done a lot of operational roles uh, with my last few roles being in uh, uh, a fintech uh, within HR. Um, I've recently moved over to the HR world in probably the last three or four years. So I kind of understand both sides of the coin, both from an HR perspective, but also from a business perspective. Uh, I find a lot of times when you're growing a business, um, you're actually growing two things. You're growing a business and you're growing a company. And sometimes those can be a little bit conflicting with the, the needs of a business in terms of getting revenue, getting clients um, and building a company, what it takes to recruit talent, what it takes to engage talent. Um, so we'll utilize uh, a little bit of my background along with our experts, Kate Jolly and uh, David Holland uh, to explore what the current talent dilemma is, how to keep momentum when your business is growing and taking the talent search global. I'll hand it over to Kate to introduce herself, who is our uh, head of talent acquisition. Hi, yeah, I'm the head of talent acquisition here at Employment Hero. I've been here for three and a half years now, so it's been a crazy journey just seeing how much we've scaled during that time frame. Um, and prior to that, I worked um, for a couple of other startups and then prior to that in an agency background where I was hiring for both big enterprises and also some really small businesses throughout the UK and Australia. So um, I've seen how hiring works for both bigger companies and also for some smaller businesses such as yourselves. Is that me? All right, I'm, I'm Dutchie or David Holland. <laughs> uh, I'm currently the general manager of Talent Solutions and in that capacity, I'm responsible for building out our solutions to help clients build great teams. And as part of that, and we'll be touching on today, helping candidates find their perfect uh, employers. Prior to that, I worked very closely and continue to work very closely with Joe around establishing and building the Global Team Service, which is our employer of record solution available through Employment Hero. And prior to that, I, I've been with Employment Hero, I think, for seven years. I originally joined as COO, but I've had a number of roles and uh, certainly enjoying my time now as a product person uh, leading the talent solutions uh, part of the platform. That's me. Thanks, Kate and Dutchie. Um, before we kick off, just want to do a quick poll to see who are who is in our audience today. Um, and there you go. I'll give you a, a short uh, amount of time to fill that in. I was trying to vote, but it tells me I can't. <laughs> I'm guessing it would be the I do everything. Other, what I'm not a a, a, a dedicated talent acquisition. That's Kate. <laughs> All right. Give me a few more seconds, and then we'll post uh, the results. I feel it. Perfect. Um, thanks for that. Appreciate it. Um, so let's get kicked off. Let's talk about the talent dilemma and what it is. So Kate, from your side uh, and from an employer's perspective, how would you describe what the talent dilemma is? Yes, good question. Um, so for me, the talent dilemma really revolves around the fact that businesses need to hire top talent at speed in order to grow and operate successfully. However, as a lot of people on this call would know, there are a lot of blockers and barriers in a traditional recruitment process that actually prevent them from doing this. Um, so the first big one that really surfaced throughout our recruitment report was just how expensive it is to hire um, and the cost really puts SMEs in particular at a disadvantage. Um, so in Australia, for example, it costs on average $5,380 um, to advertise an open role, which is mind-boggling um, and frustratingly sometimes those adverts don't actually even yield the results that you would want because the exposure is too limited. Um, secondly, 
as a lot of people would know, I saw that there are some TA professionals on the call today. Um, recruitment is really heavily dependent on timing and luck, um, more so than any talent acquisition professional would probably want to admit. Um, and even if you can identify the absolute perfect profile on LinkedIn, if the candidate isn't actually open to hearing about new roles, then there's very little chance of making a really meaningful connection with them. So for example, imagine you find the perfect profile, but they are just about to go on maternity leave, or maybe they're waiting for an end of year bonus. The timing is just not opportune and there's no way to really get them into the hiring process at the time that you need them. Um, so in summary, recruitment is actually quite a broken process and it's becoming increasingly difficult for smaller businesses to secure the right kind of talent that's required to keep their business thriving and, and scaling. Thanks for that, Kate. And uh, Dutchie, from a candidate side, what is the talent dilemma? Yeah, I think one comment that that really pains me when I talk or, or hear or, or discuss recruitment from the candidate's perspective is that I, I've, I've heard it described as finding a job can be a full-time job. And I, I just really find that very frustrating, partly because I can empathise with it and it, there's an element of truth to it, and partly because it shouldn't be. Um, there's got to be, we, we know that we have great employers out there looking for employees and we know we have a fabulous talent pool across all the markets that we work in. Uh, so it's very frustrating when you read things like finding a job is a full-time job. Um, so certainly the amount of time involved from the candidate side, and I know that's reflected by uh, Kate's experience and, and the talent acquisition side. Um, I'm also frustrated uh, at seeing companies and, oh, sorry, candidates are frustrated at seeing companies and roles that they'd like to work for uh, without ever actually having the opportunity to apply for them or seeing somebody get a job that you would have loved, uh, seeing a company fill a role that you would have loved, but you never saw, uh, never had the opportunity to apply for. And I think the last element is, is, is the communication. I think it's often referred to as ghosting, uh, where you, know, you can submit 100 applications and not hear back from anybody. And I think uh, one of the things I've definitely noticed about our process, and Kate's built this up over the last four or five years, is the, the the way in which every candidate that applies to us gets a response and not just uh, the auto response. We try very hard from my perspective to make sure that every candidate feels valued. So I think those are probably the big three uh, from a candidate's perspective that I see uh, amongst our talent pools. Awesome, thanks for that. Um, and Kate, uh, the recruitment process is always evolving, changing over the decades. Uh, what have you noticed over the last three years in terms of the recruitment process and how that's changed? Yeah, a um, couple of different things. Um, so based on what I've seen, SMEs and scale-ups have shifted towards an increasingly speedy recruitment process. Um, so they tend to be a lot more agile and they know that they can use that to their advantage. So if they find an absolute superstar in a hiring process, they know that they need to get that person on board quickly or potentially they'll lose them to a bigger business. Um, this is also driven, I think, in part by how long it takes to actually source a, a shortlist. Um, so from my perspective as someone in talent, it can actually take us a couple of weeks of really solid advertising and really solid headhunting and also receiving referrals until we've actually got together a shortlist of candidates that we feel are well suited to us and to the role um, and also that we're well suited to them that we can then present to the hiring manager. By the time that's been going on and it's been several weeks, um, we then feel like we have to race through the rest of the interview or assessment process as, as quickly as possible um, because we've already been waiting to hire this person for several weeks while we were busy on LinkedIn or um, wherever else. Um, now, on the contrary to that, I think a lot of really big businesses are often dealing with an incredibly high number of applications um, and they will often do whatever they can realistically to try and reduce the numbers um, without having um, it be too sort of labor intensive for the, the hiring panel. So that usually entails a longer hiring process um, and more hoops for, for candidates to jump through in essence. Um, so time, time of process really, really varies. Um, I've also noticed particularly in Australia and in the UK, which are two really key markets for us, that although there is a higher amount of talent available, particularly in the tech space, which is obviously where we are, um, it's still really difficult to actually find the right person. Um, and we definitely have a bit of a skill shortage. Um, and then to add to that, some candidates have also really raised their salary expectations due to concerns about the cost of living. And that is effectively, in some instances, kind of pricing them out the market for certain roles. So it's been a real interesting couple of years. 
Yeah, hey, definitely. Can, um, can and Dashi, from oh, sorry, can I just ask Kate a question. Kate, just out of interest, because I know that we get a lot of applicants for our roles, and that's a result of the employer value proposition that we've built up. It's a the the, the, the how wide we cast our net. But what proportion of place candidates at EH do you think come from headhunting, from your team using, uh, you know, their social network, their networks to go and find people? It's still yeah. pretty high, right? Yeah, I don't have the exact stat, but it would be more than 30%. Yeah, yeah. and we place around 30 roles a month, broad, broadly speaking? Uh, 45 last month. Right, okay. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Sorry, Joe, sorry to interrupt. No, no, not at all. Good question. Um, and then uh, once again, Dutchie, your perspective from a candidate side over the last three years of uh, what's changed? Yeah, well, certainly um, the last three years I've been coming out of uh, the, the lockdowns, uh, it's, it's been very much a, a candidate's market. We've seen across, and, and mostly we work across uh, developed economies. In fact, all <laughs> the five markets are all developed economies. We've seen record low unemployment. So record participation rate, it's been a candidate's market. Um, we're starting to see that turn in certain roles, not all, uh, and also quality will always be in demand. I know, Kate, you know, we're always looking for those, the best of the best, which sometimes needs to be prized loose. But um, in general, I think the biggest trend over the last three years has been that candidates have been in control and employers have had to work very hard to, to get attention. Um, and, and we'll see what happens over the next 12 months. But of course, the big news on both sides and this candidates are no different is, is, is artificial intelligence and the new tools that are, that, that are coming out powered by various technologies. Um, if, if you haven't thought much about it from the candidate perspective, it, it, it can be as simple as resume writing, cover letter writing, uh, through to apps that will trawl the web and the myriad of uh, channels through which you can actually find a job and look for the roles that, that that you train it to look for, that you instructed to look for. So as much as AI is impacting the employer side, which we'll talk about a little more shortly, it certainly uh, impacted the, uh, the the candidate side. And I want to give a, a shout out to a gentleman that I've, I've actually never met, never spoken to. Uh, but his name's John Shields, and he's a professor at the University of Sydney Business School. Uh, he's got some excellent advice for candidates and employers about um, how to manage or how to ensure that AI works for you and not against you. So his name's John Shields. I would encourage you to um, to follow him if you can find him on the web. Thanks for that, Dutchie. And Kate, you touched on it a little bit uh, about reducing the time to hire um, as best as possible. What have you noticed about that over the past uh, three years uh, since COVID hit as well? Yeah, um, quite recently, we've seen a little bit of an improvement in our speed to hire, but this has been an incredibly like deliberate area of focus for our team. And it's taken a hell of a lot of work to actually achieve this. Um, if we hadn't been as laser focused on delivering it, and if we hadn't been able to scale up our talent function to try and meet that requirement, I actually think our time to hire would probably have gotten worse. Um, I think it, there's a couple of different factors at play. Um, so firstly, in some markets, passive candidates for the last 12 months have been really, really nervous about job security and have therefore chosen to stay put with a current employer even if they aren't actually that happy there or not that happy in their role, um, it's quite difficult to tempt them into the market because they feel that there is a lack of security um, in, in kind of the current economic circumstances. Um, I'd also say that while we have just started to see, as I touched on earlier, a much bigger volume of inbound applications from active candidates, again, a lot of the profiles aren't necessarily suited to the roles that they've actually applied for, which creates more noise and more of an administrative burden for the TA team. And particularly when, um, as Dutchie mentioned, we are trying to um, stick to certain guidelines around, for example, getting back to every applicant with a response and hopefully quite a meaningful one. Um, it's really, really hard to deliver on that when you are getting so much inbound interest and there are so many different people to get back to. Um, so we've been very focused on it and as a result we've started to see some good results but i can imagine um for companies that don't have a talent function the size of ours i would not be surprised if their time to hire is, has actually got slower thanks for that kate and and dutchy how many jobs would you say are even posted publicly on job boards yeah look it's it's a uh, a contested statistic 
Uh, you'll find a very wide range if you go and look for it. But I very much lean towards the vast majority of them are never published. In fact, I'm going to say, based on the data that we see, and we see about 40,000 onboards a month through our platform across five countries, um, about 80% of those are not being sourced through job boards. So only one in five jobs is really being advertised. Um, so we see that every month. People ask me, well, how do the other 80% find it? Well, well, Kate touched on it. And the other option is, you know, we have a, a big referral uh, process as well. Uh, we have uh, word of mouth. Companies put signs in windows, you know, like that's that's a, a perfectly legitimate, you know, if you're a retail or hospitality outlet on a, on a high traffic area, um, they're putting putting jobs in, in um, job ads in their windows, help wanted. But I think, um, Joe, it's probably worth touching on at this point, <clears throat> why the job board still, still are, uh, are, are still being used as a, as a big source of, of um, candidates. And certainly if you don't have a big network uh, of, of referrers in, in your own business who can, who can bring these great talents in, then job boards are still a big option. And, and the simple answer as to why job boards exist is because they work. Uh, for most hires across a wide range of industries, um, these are great, you know, whether it's Seek or Indeed or, or, or others. Um, these work. And I think the other reason that we're still using them so widely is that it's habit. Um, you know, Seek launched in 98. Um, LinkedIn was 03 and Indeed was 04. They've been around for a long time and we've all gotten used to them. But what's interestingly is we've been interesting is when we talk to our clients and I'd be interested in the uh, in the in the sentiment in this group, uh, they very much a grudge purchase these days. They they seem to be um, getting more expensive and certainly not getting more efficient at the process as well. So that's that's where I where I stand on on boards. <laughs> Thanks for that. Um, now that you, uh, Kate, you and Dutchie have set the scene in terms of what the talent dilemma is, uh, before we move on to our next segment about how to keep momentum in this type of uh, environment, what would be the ideal recruitment scenario for a company, in your opinion? Yeah, I love this question. Um, so I think in a perfect world, we would obviously spend far less time on admin. So tasks like CV screening or sending out emails and a hell of a lot more time having meaningful conversations with candidates who are potentially well suited to our needs. Um, so as a recruiter, the magic really happens when we can enter into a really high quality discussion with a potentially suitable applicant and really assess, are they a fit for us? Are we a fit for them? Is it gonna be a match made in heaven? Um, so the ideal scenario would really be, we have a new role, we then immediately have a list of suitable candidates that we can speak to. We don't have to necessarily go through an advertising process. Um, and then we can just focus all of our efforts on the fun part, which is really learning about their background um, and properly assessing kind of the, the mutual fit. Yeah, it's, it's a similar story from the candidate side, Joe. Um, firstly, single profile, not having to go and create hundreds of profiles and apply for hundreds of roles. Um, definitely being able to see all the roles. So I mentioned earlier how frustrated candidates can be when they see a company hiring and they're getting all these great employees into roles that they want, but uh, they're not actually, these, this particular candidate isn't actually able to see that job or, or apply for it. And the ability to promote yourself to the businesses you want to. And I think that works well from the employer side, Kate, because half of what you're looking for is somebody who's passionate about working for your company as a, as a talent acquisition person. So the ability to promote yourself to the businesses you really truly want to work for would be a big part of the candidate ideal scenario too. Spot on. Uh, before we move on to our next segment of keeping momentum, just want to do one last quick poll. Um, so we'll launch that now and give you a minute to answer that. This is completely anonymous too. So all those talent acquisition professionals out there, you can be you can be honest about how you're feeling at the moment. All right, I think that's about time. Survey. 
is that you not have an extremely happy bunch, um, which is understandable uh, given the intricacies that I think all HR and TA uh, teams uh, deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And given the fact that we are a pretty big player in the market, um, we don't want to come to you just with what the current dilemma is and what the current issues are. We obviously want to talk about ways to improve your situation. Um, so, Kate, probably a big one is how do we start to, how does this, an SME or a small business steer talent away from larger businesses uh, that may be offering a little bit more salary or overall um, larger packages? Because that's always on the top of mind from candidates. Yeah, yeah. Um, salary is a considerable factor for some candidates. Um, that is a fact, um, but it's far from being the only factor. Um, I think SMEs can really shine in certain areas over perhaps a bigger business. Um, and they should really try and speak to that either in their um, how they present themselves online. So like job ads or any other kind of recruitment software they're using. Um, but also throughout the interview process, they should be selling that to the candidates as well. Um, so my first point would be when candidates work for an SME, they obviously have the opportunity to do increasingly impactful work. If you're part of a really small team, every action that you take has a very significant impact on business performance. And this can make for really heightened job satisfaction. Um, you feel that everything you're doing day in and day out is really contributing heavily towards the success of that business. Um, secondly, I think candidates to, tend to achieve um, much more rapid career development when they're working for a smaller organization. So even at a more junior level, they will obviously have more direct access to the senior leadership within a smaller business. And as part of a smaller team, they are also quite likely to get promoted sooner. They're basically a bigger fish in a smaller pond. Um, and then finally, I think that small businesses have some quite unique cultures um, and they often find it easier to have more control over the culture that they build. Um, one of the biggest challenges for an enterprise company is actually maintaining their culture and their ways of working as they scale. So if I were um, an SME, those were, were kind of the, the three things I'd probably be selling to candidates throughout the process. Yeah, that's good advice. I think that when I was posting a lot of job adverts at uh, the last company, that a lot of times uh, small companies are able to let their personality come out a little bit better through their job advertisements. Um, and it did a, a world of good for us to kind of just play with the job advertisements and work on the way that we we wrote them up, the way that we did our interviews, the way that uh, we pretty much carried ourselves, basically let that shine through because a lot of times when the price difference is between another 10K at another job that's for a big corporate um, that they've got to go into an office every single day versus a company that's a little bit more laid back, dogs in the office, uh, different value proposition. Um, and as you said, just more impactful work on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and Dashi, what would you say, uh, given the fact that you're working so uh, intensively on bringing technology into the recruitment process, what would you say is technology's role within that process? Yeah. Um, look, I think in its simplest form, uh, it's really a, there's, there's, there's a couple of simple elements to it. One is it's it's to cast the net wide. Uh, now, it doesn't matter how good your employee value proposition is, how big your salary is that you're offering, or how fantastic the mission that you're working towards. Uh, if you don't get the message out to the right people at the right place at the right time, uh, that it's not going to be effective. So I'd say first role of technology is to get that net out as wide as it can. And, and that can include things like social media. It doesn't have to be dedicated recruitment tools. So I know that we spend a lot of time or invest uh, time building out our brand as an employer uh, on social media. So cast that net wide. But then, of course, it comes very much back to getting shining the light uh, on your perfect matches, getting that bottom of funnel. Uh, as Kate said, you've got a we've got a, a huge amount of applications every for every role every day. So there's a, definitely a role for technology in helping us sift through and identify the people who are best matched to to work for you. Um, and, and I'll throw out an example of another company that is great in this space. They tend to work with very large companies who are fielding like 10,000 applicants for call centers more than, than SMEs, but there's a company called Vervo. And the reason why I like them is partly because of their solution, but they their byline is making hiring about merit, not background. And it really highlights the ability for technology um, to eliminate bias so you know it, it actually doesn't look at what school you went to or what you, what university you went to it looks at your 
your quality, your quantitative um, elements and matches those to exactly what the employer is looking for. So uh, they, they really do a great job using technology to filter out uh, those people or identify, filter out from very large sources, the best candidates. And Kate, speaking of technology, what specific tools does EH use to try to find the best candidates for us, um, as well as that enable you to have a really good candidate experience for those that you're interviewing? Yeah, so obviously everyone needs to have an applicant tracking system um, to help keep a clear record of all of your applicants, keep them updated with ease. Um, I think the biggest concern from the candidate side often, as you touched on earlier, Dutchie, um, is ghosting or just not hearing anything back. Um, it is difficult to keep on top of every single applicant, but if you're using a good applicant tracking system, it helps you to be able to provide clear, regular updates about where they're at in the hiring process and to do that in bulk so that you're not kind of repeating yourself on, on mass email threads. Um, we're also a really big fan of Calendly. Um, so it allows candidates to book time in your diary without having to go back and forth on availability. Easier for them, easier for us. Um, if you want to try something a bit fancier, there is a tool called MetaView that creates AI generated interview notes. So if you're doing really, really high volume interviews and you don't have many breaks between them, that would potentially be a really worthwhile investment. Um, again, it saves you time on admin. Um, so you can spend more time focusing on the important stuff like candidate care. Um, if you are hiring for technical roles and want an objective way of assessing a candidate's technical skill set, so for example, if you're hiring for something like a data analyst, um, you might want to look at a, a testing provider. So we use Criteria Corp and Codility, but there are a bunch of others out there as well, just depending on um, what sort of skill set you want to assess for. Um, and then finally, I would obviously also recommend Smart Match. Um, so it's still in its infancy, but we are making some, some really major improvements every two weeks. Um, and that will really change up the standard recruitment process. We will instantly, as a hiring panel, get access to a list of qualified candidates for roles that we need to fill. So I'm super excited to see what that does for our productivity and also for our time to hire metrics um, as it continues to evolve. And if you haven't checked it out yet, do so, go and have a play um, and also share your feedback on the matches. And Dutchie, before we get into Smart Match, um, obviously uh, over the last six months, there's been a lot of headlines uh, with the uh, about AI. Um, with regards to AI tools, are there any concerns uh, using algorithms with recruitment in your mind? Um, <clears throat> yeah, look, I, I think the concerns and the positives around AI and recruitment are the same as they are for AI generally. Um, we need to build AI into human resources and talent acquisition generally. Uh, in a way that minimise the negatives and maximise the positives. There, there are definitely both uh, offered up by AI in any scenario. What One thing I will say absolutely is AI is only going to grow in its AI's use in, in talent acquisition in human resources in our lives generally is only going to grow. So there's no point burying our heads in the sand and saying it's a terrible thing. It's really about how we manage it towards the outcomes that we as, as, as people and as businesses want. Um, so I think in terms of the positives, they're, they're pretty obvious in the short term. They are the ability to take that very wide funnel and narrow it down quickly. Uh, as much as we do like to provide meaningful responses to hundreds, if not thousands of applicants every month that we're not able to, to progress, it's, it's important for us to make sure that we spend our time and have those meaningful conversations that Kate just touched on yeah. with the people who are most likely to suit our needs and that we actually fill their requirements. So I think the biggest positive for AI to me is that efficiency and effectiveness in terms of the outcome of making sure that our valuable talent acquisition specialists in Kate's team spend their time with the people who are the best fit for the job. And that for me is, is really where AI is gonna play, play the biggest role. And hey, just given the fact of technology's role in the recruitment process, um, obviously there still needs to be meaningful touch points uh, with talent acquisition specialists or anybody within the HR uh, team reaching out to candidates. What would you say is currently an ideal number of rounds to have? You see some companies having up to six or seven rounds. You have, um, for example, I'm in Europe at the moment and in Germany, the interview process can last up to six to eight weeks um in front of multiple panels um what would you say is is best practice in your mind and what are some of the key elements uh that you should incorporate into those rounds i'm now striking germany from our potential 
<laughs> um, it all depends on the nature of the role and the seniority of the position. So it's a very tricky question to answer. Um, as a general rule of thumb, the hiring process for more junior roles should have fewer stages and be faster. Um, but it's totally reasonable to spend a lot more time with senior candidates. If you are making a really senior appointment for the business, they obviously have a huge impact. So they should be expect um, they should be expected to, to kind of go through more stages and, and meet with more people. We typically run roughly a three step process for very junior roles. And then the length of the hiring process tends to increase with seniority. The other thing to know is if you've got a technical role, like perhaps um, an engineering department, I'd also recommend including a technical test, um, which you can maybe count as one of the three or four rounds. Um, for certain roles, their skill set will obviously be more accurately assessed um, in an environment that mirrors what the actual work will be like. And for some roles, that's not necessarily a standard kind of back and forth Q&A interview. So um, I talked a bit about it earlier, but things like criteria, codility, um, you may want to look into those for more technical hires. Um, for kind of a typical SME, hiring a typical kind of mid-level role, I would make sure to include Firstly, um, an initial interview to assess mutual fit for the role in the work environment. Definitely some sort of second interview that's more of a deep dive into their skill set and their technical fit for the role. So like really get into the detail of how they're going to perform in the role and whether or not there are any skill gaps that might need some development. And then I'd also typically include a stage that is focused on assessing their cultural ad for the business and the team. So do they really align with the values and do they really align with our ways of working? Um, and a final tip, because um, it's something I've actually observed uh, recently in, in a few processes, uh, the hiring manager, in my view, should always be involved in the hiring process. Um, you really need to assess mutual fit. Um, is their management style and, and the way that they work with their team a good fit for the person that's going to be joining them? Great. Thanks for that, Kate. And, and Dutchie, uh, Kate touched on Smart Match uh, a few minutes ago. What is it? Where is it at now? And uh, what do you ultimately hope that it gets to within the next 12 months? Yeah. Um, so Smart Match, going back to the beginning of this conversation, that talent acquisition has to be about both the employer and the candidate. It it's definitely needs to meet the needs of both parties. Uh, Smart Match plays a role for both employers and candidates. But for the purpose of this conversation, I'll focus on the employer side. Essentially, Smart Match is a tool where we are have we look at a pool of uh, currently about four hundred thousand applicants, but it's growing by about fifteen thousand a week at the moment uh, across many countries, but obviously focused on those in which we're we're most active. Uh, it looks at those candidates, and then it looks at the roles that our clients are, are looking to, to to fill and might need to fill in the future, and essentially tries to surface those candidates, the best candidates that meet that role in the in the HR system, so that when you're looking to uh, add that fifth uh, account executive salesperson or somebody gives you notice and you need to replace a role, the instant that that recognition that you've got at that role to fill, we're actually able to meet that demand with the candidates exactly in that spot. So really what Smart Match tries to do is, is, is cut around two to three weeks off the time to hire because you won't have to uh, go and post those ads. You won't have to wait for candidates to apply. And of course, effectively, all the built-in screening, initial screening is implied because we've actually surfaced the best candidates based on the role descriptions in your business anyway. So um, that's that's what Smart Match is in a nutshell. Our utopia goal uh, is that the, the, the simplest way to, to outline it would be that we typically surface just due to real estate on the screen about the top three employees. There'll typically be anywhere between 15 and 20 matches. But my utopia, perhaps 12 months from now, would be that every time that you need to fill a role in your business, one of those top three candidates is your perfect match. That's sort of the simplest way to put it. We launched our first version at the end of August, so it's only two months old. In fact, we're still waiting for our second month of data. We have made the first matches, which is great news. But as Kate touched on earlier, it's really about learning now. There's some machine learning elements built into the platform now. And every time a role is placed, every time a role, a candidate is rejected, every time someone gives us a thumbs up or a thumbs down, all that data is now being recorded, as well as a lot of offline uh, input we're getting. We're, we're talking to clients every day about what works and what doesn't. So as Kate mentioned, we actually work to two week cycles. So every two weeks, we're able to improve the algorithms and the data on the other side and, in, and in therefore improve the matches and make them more relevant. Location is we're really starting to zone in. We're trying to get down to postcode or um, a zip code, a postcode level. 
uh, so that they're, they're really wet, you know where these people are. We're also trying to make it easier for you to identify remote employees where that matches your requirements. So there's a lot going on. By Christmas, it'll be fantastic. 12 months from now, will we be at our utopia? Well, that's our goal. Um, we don't know what we're going to encounter along the way. It's a very new technology. Uh, but I think the, the key for us is that ability to cut two to three weeks off the time to hire by surfacing the right candidates to you at the point that you realize you need them. So instead of initiating a long job search process, ideally we've got the candidates right there for you. Thanks for that uh, description. Um, and I think we're all hoping for that utopia. I mean, what better way is there to say, hey, I need this position. Oh, there's my candidate. They can start next Tuesday. Well, you can um, start, as, as Kate mentioned, it, it is live. It is active. It's in your Employment Hero accounts. Um, if you can't see it, that's I'll be surprised because we've made it pretty obvious. Um, <laughs> but you can certainly hit up our support team if you need uh, need any any help. And uh, beyond Smart Match, um, given the current struggle over trying to find the right talent for uh, one or your own business um, and the cost that it takes uh, on a business to not find that talent quickly, um, Kate touched upon it a little bit earlier with regards to basically casting a wider net and basically not just looking within that small pond of candidates that you have locally, but perhaps internationally. So Kate, in your experience, what are the motivating factors for why small businesses begin hiring regionally or internationally? There are a bunch. Um, I'll just maybe list a couple of the top ones, I think. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, you tend to find that certain countries or regions are very strong for different types of talent. So for example, it's well known that you can find a load of great software engineers in Eastern Europe. And relatively speaking, there aren't actually that many in Australia. It's a pretty small pool and it's highly, highly competitive. So if you're hoping to scale up an engineering team, it obviously makes sense to start considering talent in somewhere like Poland. Um, secondly, I think candidates in different countries bring quite a uniquely valuable perspective um, depending on the nature of your business and where you operate. So for example, if you're like a British e-commerce business, but you also ship internationally and you would like to grow an international customer base, it obviously makes sense and is really valuable to have people in your team who can educate you about alternative markets and who understand how things maybe work outside of the UK. Um, I also think for certain types of roles, there is clearly a, a cost saving associated um, with hiring in, in certain other markets. The cost of living is vastly different in different locations. And so if you hire internationally, again, depending on the, the country, you can really pay people a very fair wage and a competitive wage, um, but still potentially at a cost saving to yourself. Um, those are, are some of probably the, the top reasons that I've heard. And Dutchie, just to get the elephant out of the room, um, isn't hiring internationally just outsourcing? You're on mute. No, no, it's not. Um, I think it can be. Um, and certainly if we look back at the days of business process outsourcing shops uh, in, in, in low cost labor areas, the old BPO model, that, that was outsourcing in my view, because you were essentially engaging a company, not an individual. Uh, with our employer of record service, Global Teams, Joe, I don't need to tell you about it. You run it. Um, and, you know, employer of records generally, the ability to build your own team is what you're doing. You're just doing it in in, in more locations where the, the, the talent you need is actually available. Uh, and retention can be much higher too, because I'll, you know, those people are looking for that work because they are living where they want to live. And if they don't have to relocate, then they're more likely to stay with you. So I think what makes it different um, when you're building a team remotely through, say, an, a, a global team's employer record is that you select your candidates, you interview them, you manage them, you promote them, you uh, performance improve them, which doesn't happen in the old BPO model. Uh, so I think that's that's the case. I mean, it's worth noting, Joe, that of our, how many employees do we have now, Kate? Is it 850 or has it gone up again? Employees, I think, yeah. we, I think we're about 900. 900, it's hard to keep up. Uh, but last time I checked, we were employing those people across 15 countries. You yourself, Joe, touched on it earlier. You're currently in an attic in Amsterdam where you live with your family. <laughs> you and I talk probably every day. Um, Not so, just the attic, we have more area. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so, you know, Employment Hero have 900 employees across 15 countries, which we've built in the last uh, two or three years. We had 200 when we went remote. We're now close to 1,000. Um, and it happened really well. And it happened well because 
we did it very deliberately. And what that means is Kate's team and the hiring managers, and I'm one of them, you're one of them, uh, now have the ability to look at candidates across every country in the world. So we can find the best people wherever they are. And, and so, no, to answer your question directly, international hiring is not outsourcing. It's just broadening your talent pool. I hope that's clear Good enough. Good way to put it. And, and, and so, Kate, why aren't small businesses hiring globally? I think there is a perception that it's very difficult to do. Um, and a lot of companies don't realize how easy it can be if you approach it in the right way. Um, common feedback is that they're nervous maybe about getting to grips with local employment laws or local employee benefits. All the, the kind of legal complexity is often what puts them off. Um, but I would really encourage everyone to have a look at it. Um, I am not from a core HR background. Um, and as Dutchie just, just touched on, we've now got staff in about 15 different locations. Um, and it's been surprisingly straightforward um, hiring in all of those markets and incorporating those guys into the team. And uh, last question is one, Kate, for you. Um, what are things that small businesses should be looking at uh, if they're look if they're thinking of hiring internationally? Yeah, okay. Um, so firstly, I would say your ways of working will potentially need to adapt. Um, if you're thinking of hiring someone particularly in another time zone, you will need to accommodate for that. If it's quite a large uh, time gap or time difference, um, then what I would recommend is maybe moving towards more asynchronous communication where possible. We use a lot of that at Employment Hero, documenting things in Confluence, using a lot of Slack messages and Slack channels. Um, it's a really good way to make sure that people are still in touch regardless of the time difference. Um, you will also need to consider that things like statutory entitlements and employee benefits differ by market. Um, what will your approach to that be? Um, will you pay kind of the statutory entitlement or would you like to make things very even across every market? Um, and finally, if you're typically office based, um, you will obviously need to think about how to make remote employees feel included. It's very possible, but I think you have to be very deliberate with how you go about doing that so that the person that's remote in another location doesn't feel like the, the odd one out. Yeah, Joe, can I jump in there? I just want to add to a few things Kate said, and I think we're going very much off script now. Um, but it's that deliberateness. A lot of people don't appreciate necessarily how much effort goes into running an office. And I think there was this expectation that when you went remote, some, somehow all of that went away. It doesn't. It just shifts from putting that time, effort, and money into building an office culture, you put that time, money, and effort into building the tools and, and processes and culture remotely. So that, that's my number one tip. Just to add to what uh, Kate was saying about um, finding and employing and managing people remotely. Uh, firstly, and I, I don't want to make this all about smart match, but, but before Christmas, before Christmas, I've told the, the product team, we will have the ability to see candidates from around the world, and you'll be able to filter that. So at the moment, it's very much location driven. Version 1.2 that we're currently on is very much based around where is the candidate? Where are you? We're going to match you with the closest person. But by Christmas, you'll actually be able to explore and you will see candidates from the UK, Philippines, New Zealand, uh, Singapore, wherever our we have about 25,000 candidates from outside of our, our five core countries and they will be introduced. So you'll be able to see that. And then in terms of, so that's how you would recruit or at least uh, source those type, type of, of, of remote employees. So you'll see a broader talent set. The second thing is we already have today, Joe, thanks to the great work of, of you and your team, the ability to onboard people in just about any country uh, digitally. So uh, the goal for the global teams group that we set was make it as easy to employ someone remotely as it is locally. And so the product now uh, largely does that. And if you haven't looked around at the global teams option within the within the, the platform find it um, and if you can't find it get in touch with support and I'll show you it's going to become a very powerful tool once we introduce the uh, the global talent pool into smart match before Christmas so that's that's kind of in terms of allowing SMEs to access the kind of multinational uh, uh, workforce that, that that global companies access uh, we're just about there and we're, we're probably 90 percent of the way there today so 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 please if you're interested in building a remote team, explore Employment Hero, or get in touch with the team. Thanks, uh, Kate and Dutchie, for answering all my questions. I think now we'll move to the gallery. Um, we've got a few questions uh, in there now. Uh, first one, Kate, uh, is for you. Um, 
How is uh, a small business able to navigate the challenges around determining existing slash prior workers' compensation claims, pre-injury and police checks upon recruitment? So, uh, can you, Kate, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah. Can you go through the list again? Yeah. Um, I, how is could a small I, could business? Can I jump in, Joe? I, I think this question is a very specific use case. Um, and I just want to say, as far as workers' compensation goes, it's probably not a conversation that we want to have in a general uh, public yeah. environment. <laughs> yeah, look, even within Australia, it differs state by state, let alone country to country, and we do have an international audience. So can I redirect the question a little bit, Kate, and talk mm -hmm. about pre-employment screening? So, so if that person wants to get in touch with us directly about that specific question, we can absolutely help you. So hit up support at employmenthero.com but I don't want to have a general conversation around workers' compensation. Yeah. <laughs> a pre-employment screening, like how important is it? What technologies are you using? Criminal checks, background checks, right to work, visas? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we use um, a third party, and I can't recall their name, I'm sorry, um, for background checking um, and making sure that everyone has is suited to work for Employment Hero. Um, but we do kind of professional references typically in-house um, and we're often quite particular about the people that we choose to speak with. Um, so we'll often want to speak with their most recent line manager um, and perhaps a, another line manager or a senior leader from their former employer. Um, and we're, we're pretty thorough with the, the level of reference checking that we do. And the questions are very targeted to make sure that their former managers agree that their skill set and their ways of working align to Employment Hero. So references in-house and then um, sort of criminal record checks and things, third party. Yeah, and Joe, I can add just as a little uh, teaser, I know that our core HR team is currently scoping pre-employment screening generally. Uh, I can't say it's going to hit workers' compensation directly for the reasons I mentioned, but uh, we will be bringing more pre-employment screening tools directly into the platform in the next six months would be my guess, because I know the product manager on it and they're very good. So uh, we'll see oh, some good, good results there. Um, and, and Kate, speaking of uh, hiring globally, um, what adjustments uh, has EH had to make uh, with regards to finding talent globally uh, that was different from just looking domestically within Australia? Yeah, there are a couple of obvious things. Um, so, for example, if you're hiring in a different location, their public holidays are going to be localized um, and you and the line manager need to be aware of that. Um, you also really need to think about key cultural differences. So for example, if you typically do something like a Christmas shutdown period for two weeks at the end of the year, but you're now hiring candidates in locations where perhaps they don't celebrate Christmas, um, it's not best practice to um, kind of push them to take leave during that time period. And what I'd recommend doing instead is maybe shifting it to a different time of year that is better suited to them um, and, and a holiday that they celebrate. Um, so there are a few kind of small tweaks along those lines that we've really had to think about and consider over the last few years. And then the other thing um, that Dutch and I both talked a little bit about earlier um, is firstly, really focusing on our ways of working, really pushing the need for kind of documentation and asynchronous communication so that people in other time zones um, have access to the right information and you can collaborate effectively. Um, and there are a bunch of different tools that you can use to help with that as well. So we use things like Asana, Confluence, um, any kind of project management software or toolage would really help if you've got uh, kind of an increasingly global workforce. Well put, um, and that looks like it's officially our last question for this uh, webinar. Um, a huge thank you to uh, both Kate and Dutchie for the, answering the barrage of questions. Uh, we hope that uh, it was informative for each of you and that uh, you got a few little tips. Uh, what's really good is that um, this recording will be shared with you afterwards. Um, we've just put up a link as well to one of our LinkedIn groups uh, that you can join. Um, there you can ask any question you like um, and pretty much Dutchie and me man it. Um, and we'll get back to you as soon as possible um, to answer anything specific uh, or even general. Um, so feel free to take that QR code that will be shared with you as well in the email you receive post this. Um, a reminder that there will be a survey that'll be launched directly after this webinar. So we would appreciate if you take a minute just to fill it in. Give us some feedback. Let us know how we can make our next webinar uh, even better and more informative for yourselves. 
Um, as well as we'll be sending out a link to the state of recruitment reports uh, that we've just released. Uh, so we look forward to seeing you again next time. Uh, appreciate your attendance and have a great rest of your day.